Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. I'm Harvey Shapiro, and I'd like to welcome you to our monthly uh, Smith Family Foundation uh, Public Policy Forum. Uh, tonight, we're going to be talking about uh, the issue of uh, the American and the Western European version or vision of, uh, of capitalism. Uh, there are uh, different, strong differences of opinion uh, on both sides of the Atlantic as to who is charting the right course and ultimately who is charting the uh, most sustainable course. <clears throat> we hope to explore that uh, in some depth tonight, uh, both by hearing from our speakers and by the questions that members of the audience will put to them. I think the issue in a nutshell is fairly clear. I've just, in fact, been in Europe two or three times in the last uh, four months, and I was regaled with tales of uh, people who get five weeks vacation in Germany, six weeks vacation in Denmark, they have a 35 hour work week in France, you get six, not only six months of maternity leave in Sweden, but 10 days of paternity leave as well, all paid by your employer. Uh, there's an assortment of other very attractive benefits available to people, as well as simply the lifestyle that Americans all, I think, find quite attractive. You can be sitting in the cafe, uh, sipping your cappuccino, but at the same time, many wonder if this is in fact all a sustainable approach to the economic realities facing Europe with an aging population with uh, competitors around the world. Uh, the European view I, in many circles, I think, is that they've got it right. Americans are pursuing a kind of cowboy capitalism, a kind of Darwinian, Darwinian approach that really isn't necessary or attractive. Uh, but the critics would respond that uh, the European example just simply isn't sustainable. They are living beyond their means and they will reap uh, the rewards or the, the pain of their sloth later on. So uh, who's right? Uh, we hope to get some sense of that in our discussion tonight. We have with us two, I think, distinguished economic observers, um, and they're going to each offer some opening remarks. I'm going to put some questions to them, and then I'm going to invite questions from the audience. Let me tell you who's joining us uh, tonight. On my far left, Jeffrey Madrick is currently editor of Challenge Magazine, an interesting uh, publication that focuses on economic issues. He's also visiting professor of humanities at the Cooper Union. It is the Director of Public Policy Research at the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the New School. Until about a month ago, he was also one of the contributing economic columnists for the New York Times, a post he held for some five years. He has written several books, including Taking America and the End of Affluence, both of which were New York Times Notable Books of the Year. He also uh, has written several other books. He's a frequent uh, contributor to the New York Review of Books. Uh, he was formerly the finance editor, editor of Business Week magazine and formerly a, uh, a reporter and commentator at NBC News. Uh, he's joined by, on my immediate left, uh, Edmund Phelps, who's been at the Department of Economics at Columbia University since 1971, and he's now the McVicker Professor of Political Economy. He has written widely on a host of uh, economic issues. He's, I gather, in some circles, at least best known for developing an expectations-based microeconomic uh, uh, analysis uh, having to do with uh, uh, employment and wage price dynamics. Uh, for purposes of this meeting, I think it's important to note that he's been deeply involved as a as an author and a consultant uh, on issues having to do with Europe. He's been an advisor and a consultant to men, many uh, public policy uh, organizations in Europe. He's also written Enterprise and Inclusion in Italy, a, book, a, a monograph in which he tells me he finds neither enterprise nor inclusion in Italy, but perhaps we'll hear about some of that later. He's written a number of books, but I suspect is best known to many of us for his uh, economics textbook called Political Economy. I'm going to invite uh, Professor Phelps to offer some remarks first, <clears throat> then uh, Jeff Madrick, then we will turn to some questions and discussion. I'm very happy <clears throat> to have this opportunity to discuss uh, issues about the two contrasting kinds of economic systems sets of economic institutions that have grown up in the U.S. 
on the one hand and continental Western Europe on the other. It is an important subject, clearly, otherwise you wouldn't be here tonight, and one on which I think I have something to say, though I'm sure that understanding of these two systems is still at a pretty early stage. I have a series of <clears throat> questions to um, address. What is satisfactory economic performance? Is there any evidence that economic performance <clears throat> in Western continental Europe falls short of uh, performance in the United States on the whole? Finally, what kind of economic system is needed to generate acceptable uh, performance according to uh, the prevailing uh, conception? In particular, to the extent that the European economy falls short, <clears throat> Uh, what appears to be some of the key institutional deficiencies and roadblocks that the continent suffers from or suffers from more than the U.S. does? Okay, well, to begin with the first question, I don't see how, for purposes of intelligible discussion, we can evaluate the continent's economic performance in comparison with that of the U.S without having some conception of what good economic performance is fundamentally about. For me at least, an economy cannot be said to be uh, well performing. It has not gotten to first base. If the participants are not generally flourishing. And that deep kind of prosperity entails that the jobs in the economy are on the whole, intellectually engaging and intellectually uh, rewarding. That means a wide availability of work, enlisting the minds of job holders, offering challenges in problem solving, leading them to discover much of their talents, and fostering an expansion of their abilities. The discovery and development of talents and capabilities is the essence of one's intellectual growth and a huge part of one's personal growth as a whole. Uh, in this uh, conception of, of good performance, <clears throat> uh, high productivity uh, is also important. It's important because thanks to the high wages that high productivity uh, tends to deliver, uh, people can afford to take engaging uh, challenging work. Now I've heard it commented that this is a, a very American sort of view, not one expressed certainly in Europe where they work to live, not live to work. <clears throat> but that conception of the good career, the one I was just describing, and indeed the good life, originated in Europe. <clears throat> Aristotle said, all men desire knowledge. Cervantes in Don Quixote expresses this sort of vitalism. So did the French philosopher Henri Bergson. Americans took it on board, William James and John Dewey, and in our, in our time, uh, two Harvard philosophers, John Rawls and Amartya Sen. Of course, to measure such discovery and development is difficult especially uh, on a national scale. However, the degree of prosperity in the above sense, so to speak, the rate of intellectual growth, may well be proxied more or less well by several measures of the level of business activity, the participation rate and the unemployment rate. There are other measures too, the emigration rate, fertility rate, and so forth. I don't believe that expressions of happiness have very much to do with people's engagement in their work, their learning, their mastering, their growing scope, and so forth. Um, I don't think that Beethoven, Wagner, and Stravinsky were particularly happy men, but so what? Um, they seem to be uh, quite involved in their work and uh, grew enormously and um, 
in uh, their um, <coughs> scope. <coughs> On the second question, the evidence, <coughs> it is not evidence of a well-built economy to point to rapid growth rates racked up in some uh, extraordinary period, unusual period, such as the continent's glorious years of catch-up roughly between 1955 and 1975. Of course, an, econo an economy exhibits high growth rates of the gross domestic product when, for reasons of hyperinflation or depression or war or all of those, it has fallen far behind the production methods being used by the industrial leaders in the world. If we want to look at productivity, it would be best to look at relative levels of productivity, of output per, per man hour or per hour worked, <clears throat> in order to gauge how big a gap there is between an economy, the one we're looking at, and the, the leading economies. In this respect, the economies on the continent are distinctly behind the US. In 1992, a year in which there was some uh, careful work by Robert Solow and Martin Bailey, uh, <clears throat> France and Germany were at about 92% of the US level. And we know that this gap has grown somewhat since that time. The more important indicators, I think, are labor force participation and the unemployment rate, the more important proxies of the deep down important stuff. <clears throat> it is a sign of the poor satisfactions from career and work in the country, uh, if a relatively high proportion of working age people are not interested in participating in the business economy, if they delay for years entering the labor force or retire early or just never enter. The continent <clears throat> signals relatively low levels of job satisfaction here. In the US, 87% of working age men, I focus on them because there's so many distinct issues about participation of women. In the US, 87% of working age men are in the labor force. In France, it is only 75%. Italy, 74%. Germany is not quite so bad at 82%. As you know, unemployment rates in the continental economies have been off and on uh, in double-digit territory in the past 20 years, and, and are so um, today. <clears throat> the third and final question. <clears throat> what is the character that an economy's system of economic institutions has to have in order to generate involvement, problem-solving, discovery of talent, and ever-widening uh, capabilities. I think the system has to have the quality that we might call dynamism. It has to generate change, and in that way, new problems to solve, new opportunities for discovery and development of talents. And that's precisely the character of um, of a uh, genuinely uh, or, and relatively unalloyed uh, capitalist system, at least if it is suitably set up and appropriately regulated so as to be um, well-functioning. There is some evidence <clears throat> that the economies having capitalist institutions in a relatively high state of development do possess more dynamism than the other economies. The boom that some economies experienced and others did not during the late 1990s was almost a laboratory experiment to detect what regularities could be found among the comparatively unresponsive economies. The US did relatively well, taking off like a shot, really, in uh, 1997 while the economies on the continent did relatively poorly in responding to the radically novel opportunities of the internet telecommunication revolution. Some 
<clears throat> institutions appear here to be of uh, key importance in, in uh, influencing the responsiveness of economies to new opportunities. Uh, with regard to the, these 12 large uh, OECD countries that uh, I was uh, comparing, uh, economies with stock markets having a wide coverage over the economy, economies with university systems having wide coverage, so a lot of people have university degrees, and economies with labor laws that give entrepreneurs plenty of license to hire and fire, <clears throat> like a capitalist entrepreneur should have, were relatively quick to leave the starting blocks in 1996. It's just amazing how poorly some of the continental economies score on a statistic such as proportion of the labor force with a university degree. And entrepreneurs need to have educated managers and workers if they're going to be engaged in novel, uh, adventurous uh, undertakings. <clears throat> we have farther to go to get a fuller sense of what holds back the continent from having an economy that is as innovative and thus as dynamic as the American one. My own hypothesis, <clears throat> um, I want to remark here that it, it's, it's kind of mechanical to pick out of the air a few key institutions and see whether they give a statistical explanation of how some economies are less responsive than others. What's going on here? Why these four or five institutions? Why not uh, scrounge around for another five or ten years and find some other set of institutions? So, so what under, there must be some underlying thing, some common uh, element uh, beneath, beneath, the, uh, beneath these individual institutions. My hypothesis here is that a large role is played by the ideas of corporatism, which flowered and were introduced into economic policy in the interwar years of the 1920s and the 1930s, first by uh, Mussolini, as you know. <clears throat> corporatism rose to influence on the belief that it could be a more scientific way to produce economic progress. Uh, which, of course, was ironic, but, and it, it failed utterly to uh, deliver more economic progress. But its other elements, particular, particularly its uh, communalism, its philosophy of the social partners, and its tendency to seek unanimity among all the interest groups has militated against change, against progress, and ultimately against a flourishing business world. Okay, Professor Phelps, thank you very much. Uh, for those of you who remember some of the earlier uh, announcements of this event, uh, Jeremy Rifkin had been signed up to uh, share his views, but we had some differences of opinion with him as to the format. Uh, going forward. I'm very pleased to have Jeffrey Madrick step in. Jeff is, uh, I think, an eloquent spokesman for uh, a number of interesting ideas, and I'm happy to call him to the podium. Thank you. That was like being a substitute hitter. You can hear me without that, right? Nice, it's nice to be here. Thanks very much for inviting me, and it's very nice to be here with Professor Phelps. For those of you who don't know, he is a household name among academic economists. Krugman, I think, referred to him recently as an economist economist, and I, th and I think that epithet fits. Uh, so, it's a privilege to be here. We disagree about some things, needless to say. And I'm delighted to be here to talk about this subject because it's very close to my heart. <clears throat> Let me give you the punchline, because we only have 10 or 12 minutes. The punchline for me is the European model, and there are several European models. There's, a, roughly speaking, if we use the Esping-Anderson breakdown, there's a Scandinavian model. I think 
because I knock this little thing off, I'm gonna, you're going to hear a pop from time to time. Uh, the Scandinavian model, there's the continental European model, there are probably breakdowns within that, and indeed there have been different performances among European nations. But the punchline for me, the bottom line is this, and I hope to eventually uh, demonstrate it to you. The European models will probably out perform the American models in an age when human capital, that is investing in ourselves, our education, our sophistication, uh, also uh, the equality of that kind of investment is ever more important. My guess is <clears throat> the European economies are going to do better than that because of their dedication to, to those kinds of factors as public goods in which, which require government investment, and indeed occasionally taxes, a word we don't like these days. And the second point I think is my guess is we're in for long-term slow growth compared to the last hundred years of let's call it the second industrial revolution. If we're going to grow slower, if the economic pie, GDP, is going to grow slower, we're going to have less revenues to divide. I indeed think that's what happened since the 1970s. I don't think America is very good at dividing those revenues. I think we have an ideology and a political philosophy that's going to make it uh, difficult to divide them in ways that are productive for the economy and represent what we consider our best virtues, not least equality of opportunity. Uh, let me go on to tell you why this, this subject is so close to my heart, because I think that this is not to say Europe doesn't have problems and America doesn't do some things very well. But we have led, we have gotten to a point, we are, we, we are so biased and so triumphalist again, I don't think we see things well. It's always interesting to me that Americans admire so much the modest man, the Gary Cooper movie star. And yet, we are so willing to talk about how we are almost invariably the best country in the world. I don't want to make too many jokes about that. It's easy to make jokes about that. Uh, but let me give you a couple of examples. There's a book recently, by, I, I wrote about this recently in the New York Review of Books, a book by a man named John Steele Gordon, a history book. He's, he writes a column for the American Heritage. And he wrote this, virtually every major development in technology in the 20th century, which was far and away the most important century in the history of technology originated in the United States. Now let me repeat that. Virtually every major development te in technology in the 20th century originated in the United States or is principally industrialized or turned into consumer products here. Now I bounce that off a few people. They say, oh yeah, that, that's right. Let's talk about the early century when Germany led the way <clears throat> in chemistry and Americans took as war booty the German patents in organic chemistry in 1918 and 1919. <clears throat> Let's talk about commercializing consumer products. Americans didn't commercialize the aspirin. Bayer commercialized the aspirin. And Clifford Odets called it the age of aspirin in the 1940s. Let's talk about, have we forgotten the Toyota revolution? and the Sony electronics revolution in America. Europeans made virtually all the major discoveries in nuclear energy until World War II. Virtually all of them. We had a cyclotron. We did some things. In rocketry, Germans and Russians led the way, apart from Robert Goddard's important work here. <clears throat> we can go on and on. Europeans made contributions to optics and even the running shoe that quintessential American product. Now this book, which is full of this kind of thing, got two very good reviews in the New York Times, the Sunday Times <clears throat> and the Daily Times, and it was called perhaps the best economic history we have in one volume by a very well-known uh, columnist for the Washington Post <clears throat> and Newsweek. What's going on here? Or consider David Brooks the other day in the New York Times. <clears throat> a conservative a col uh, columnist for the New York Times. He talked about the, uh, the Great Society, and he said, look what the Great Society, basically he said this, and maybe I'm not being fair to him. The, basic society, the Great Society created unwed mothers, <clearly> single, fa single parent families, welfare dependency, and on and on. He didn't say, of course, that the poverty rate <clears throat> after those policies fell from 22% of Americans to 10 or 11%. He didn't say that 
elderly poverty rate fell from 35% to, I think, 8 or 9% today, and so on. He didn't talk about how the achievement gaps and education gaps of African Americans and whites closed dramatically in the ensuing 20 years. He only remembered this other thing. And finally, the FT, the Financial Times, a newspaper I respect a lot, talked about this gap between the US, <clears throat> the US and Europe. And uh, didn't once mention tight monetary policy in Europe as at least a contributing factor to slower growth in Europe over the last few years. Now, everyone has applauded Alan Greenspan for loose monetary policy as a contributing factor to American economic growth uh, since the mid-1990s. But we don't criticize the European Central Bank for tight monetary policy as if it was inconsequential. This is a sophisticated newspaper. There's a serious bias going on here. What's happening? Why this triumphalism? Well, part of the reason, obviously, is we've been the winners for the last few years. But rather than this being a laboratory of, uh, for what creates economic growth and productivity, probably it's five, six, seven years of a particular set of circumstances that have put the US in the lead. Now, maybe it'll last, maybe it won't. I have some doubts. Let me step back for a second. Is GDP and productivity really the way to measure uh, welfare in a society? Professor Phelps adds, I think, some interesting points about the quality of jobs and so forth. Those are well taken. But what about the quality of health care? What about measures like longevity? <clears throat> what about measures like infant mortality? What about measures like literacy? What about measures like equality? What about leaving large pockets of Americans behind in this great march forward? And what are the long-term consequences of that kind of thing? Is GDP enough of a, a good enough measure for us to be making serious policy decisions based on the rapid growth of GDP. And that includes productivity. Now, productivity is the output per hour of work. It's the source of a rising standard of living, source of our well-being. Without growing poverty, we're not going to get rising wages and rising salaries. But does rising productivity automatically lead to rising wages and rising salaries? I always teach in class, you know, we have enough history to support this idea that it does. But what's happened to this great economic model over the last three or four years? Productivity has kept going up for who knows what reasons. Wages haven't. Wages have grown at unusually slow, at unusually slow pace. And in fact, hourly wages fell in 2004 after inflation, fell at a time when productivity was doing very well and GDP was growing. So is this a guarantee for improved welfare in a society? But let's claim that GDP is good enough. Let's accept that. My numbers differ a little bit with Professor Phelps on how productive Europe is compared to America. I looked up the GDP numbers. Maybe he has some argument about the way they're computed by the OECD. <clears throat> In 2003, those are the latest numbers I found. It could have been mid-2004, now that I think about it, forgive me. Uh, the US was seventh, number seven on the list. You know who was ahead of the US on this list? That is output per hour of work, I believe corrected for purchasing price parity. France was ahead of the US on this list. So were a number of Nordic countries. What happened, well, in fact, if you look at the growth rates of labor productivity, since 1990, they're about equal in the US compared to the EU. <clears throat> the EU grew much more rapidly from 1990 to 1995. Labor productivity grew much more rapidly from 1995 to 2003 in the US. They kind of evened out at 1.8 or 1.9 percent. <clears throat> Are those five or eight years sufficiently long to talk about a new model for economic growth? I don't think so. I talked about some of the failures of the U.S. model. Uh, are those failures sustainable? Can we continue to have quite extraordinary inequality in incomes? Unbelievably wide inequality in wealth? For every $12 of wealth that the median white person has, that's equity in a house plus financial assets plus all those Picassos we all have in our apartments and houses. For every $12 of that, African Americans have $1 of wealth and that gap is just not closing. <clears throat> 
Is that kind of thing sustainable in America? Is inequality in education sustainable? Are the constant, is this constant problem with achievement in public schools the issue? And don't think that this achievement has to do with the fact that there are pockets, large pockets of urban poverty, <clears throat> often dominated by uh, minorities. Some work <clears throat> done by Peter Lindert, for example, suggests that when you adjust for that kind of thing and compare achievement of white kids to white kids in similar privileged situations in foreign countries, white kids in America are also falling behind in achievement tests. And what about those university educations in Europe? Well, we all know, I guess, that high school education is better in Europe, by and large, than American education. But what about the university education? They don't go to the university. Guess what's happening? Guess what we're falling behind on and not realizing? The, race, the, the proportion of young people going to university in America stopped growing in the early 1990s. In fact, after years of progress, African Americans are falling back. And thirdly, in fact, Europeans in many countries are starting to forge ahead where 25 year old, a higher proportion of kids, 25 years and under in a couple of countries, are now going to university, a higher proportion than in America. So what are these? I'll just, I'll wrap up in a sec. Uh, let me uh, deal with just a, a couple of Professor Phelps observations about institutions. Stock markets, the university system, labor laws. <clears throat> the great golden age of growth, as you all know, is after World War II, not only in the catch-up countries, because their technologies were devastated, but in the US as well. And I would argue, I guess, though I don't fully understand, I do think there's, uh, Professor Phelps makes some good points about corporatism, but I would guess that the, ninth, the ninth system in America, the economic system in America of big business, big government, and big labor was never more active in the 1950s and 1960s. That was a partnership of cooperation for the most part. Galbraith called it countervailing power, but I think there was an awful lot of cooperation. I would call it corporatism, and you know what? It produced the fastest growth we've had in American history. Arguably, there was faster growth in the late 1890s and early 1900s, but for the most part, the fastest growth we've had. Corporatism, my point is that these, there is no universal answer to these kinds of questions. Sometimes, in different circumstances, corporatism works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes you have to loosen up that economy. Sometimes even wages are too high. They probably got, as a proportion of GDP, too high in the 1960s in America. But beware of universal answers. In sum, the Europeans, over the longer run, are going to spend more money, more intelligently, on human capital. And that really makes me worry about the future of America. Thanks. <laughs> well, we've heard some interesting and I think some opposing uh, uh, views as to uh, where our respective uh, parts of the world are uh, stand and where we're headed. I'm going to ask a couple of questions, and while I'm doing that, I invite you to uh, uh, think of questions yourselves. You'll note that there are microphones posted on each side of the room, and if you take up a position behind them, I will ultimately call on you, and you can ask your questions. But I want to come back to a couple of things that our speakers have said. First of all, let me ask Professor Phelps in particular. Uh, Jeffrey Madrick talked about, as he said, the failure of the U.S. model, and he based much of this on the inequality of income and wealth. Is the, do you, would you agree as to the failure of the U.S. model, and do you think inequality is the appropriate measure for, for, for coming to that conclusion? Um, <clears throat> well, let me just say, when I was invited to this uh, debate, I, I got the impression, perhaps incorrectly, that it was focused on the economic model and not on the full range of social policies. Uh, so um, in uh, coming up with some evidence in favor of the, of the U.S. economic model over the continental Western uh, European model, I didn't mean to endorse uh, the full gamut of social policies in this country. I mean, I've always thought 
We can have a welfare state in this country alongside capitalism. It's, it's not a problem. There's no, there's, no, there's no opposition between capitalism and a welfare state. As a matter of fact, without some welfare state, it would never have been possible to retain capitalism in, in this uh, country. <clears throat> and I've publicly complained a lot <clears throat> about the shoddy statistical work that some of my colleagues, not at Columbia, do. Clearly. Uh, uh, trying to uh, relate statistically uh, the payroll tax rate used to finance the welfare state in Europe on the one hand and the unemployment rate on the other hand, country by country. Uh, someone once found that among G7 countries there is a strong relationship between payroll tax rate and uh, unemployment rate. But when you look at the 20 or so standard OECD economies, that cross-section relationship falls to pieces. So, um, <clears throat> uh, so I, I, I don't know what to say except that uh, yeah, I, I was not uh, not endorsing uh, not endorsing uh, uh, shoddy health care or uh, inadequate health insurance or inequality. And so on. As a matter of fact, it has it seemed to me a real shame, and I've written about this in a book called Rewarding Work, published in 1997, a real shame that we can't get the U.S. Congress to pass low-wage employment subsidies as a means of pulling up wage rates at the bottom and drawing more disadvantaged people into full-time, regular, uh, legitimate employment in the business sector would be a big shot in the arm for the legitimacy of, of uh, capitalism. But um, administration after administration, Democrats and Republicans alike, just seem not to have the uh, courage to go in that direction. Mm -hmm. We do have EITC, mm -hmm. the, uh, but that's been captured by uh, particular groups and uh, until very recently, it wasn't available to, say, single men, who were perhaps the most disadvantaged of all. Uh, it was simply wasn't available to them. Now that's been changed mm -hmm. a little bit. Let me it, it turn also to something else Jeffrey Madrick said. You talked about, over the long term, slow economic growth. Was that with reference to the US in particular? It wasn't clear to me. And uh, put that in both kind of, painted in both relative and absolute terms. Uh, slow growth, what does that say vis-a-vis -vis Europe and vis-a-vis and -vis, uh, the rest of the world, Asia or developing economies? Is that a yes, um, yeah, yeah, the econ economies in the developed world slowed down in the beginning. Uh, around 1973 with the OPEC oil price hike, the slowdown was most noticeable in the U.S., which lost at least a percent of growth a year probably, or, and a percent of growth of, of productivity of 73. Oh a productivity percent a year. Over time, that adds up to an enormous amount of money over 25 years. Now, that's changed some beginning in 1996 or so. It changed a lot. We don't know whether that's the beginning of a new rapid trend or not. The economy recently has run into some trouble. But um, our, I think it's very clear that the, econ the U.S. economy grew significantly more slowly than it had over any other 20 or 22 year period, including the depression, because we came out of the depression uh, uh, within 10 years or so, um, uh, than at any time since the Civil War, and it probably if we hadn't had the Civil War, it would have been even a longer stretch of much more rapid growth. Um, I, do, I do want to say that I didn't, uh, I, I, the, the other countries' grow, growth slowed down as well in this period, including the infamous Japanese productivity growth, which was who they were supposed to have discovered the way to rapid productivity growth forever. They did a remarkable job in some industries, but it didn't cover the economy as a whole. It didn't but rejuvenate going, the economy. But forward. I do, do want to say that I didn't only talk about equal, inequality when I was critic, but criticizing the U.S. economy. Mm -hmm. uh, there are. Uh, uh, I think health care is a serious issue, unequal education is a serious issue. Those are the things that make up human capital. But going forward, are you expecting the U.S. to grow more, you expect it to grow slowly, but slower than Europe? 
And, and uh, both of them slower than the uh, I, more when, the when, developing economies? When, you know, the, one of the things I did learn in school was you can't forecast. Um, but my, but when I, what I'm talking about, about human capital growth, is over the medium to long run. Do I think this will all become evident in five or ten years? No, but I think, I think the central input is human capital. And I, I wanted to make one other thing clear that I just didn't have time to get to in my analysis. There is no serious evidence, and, and I don't know whether Professor Phelps is arguing this or not, but I know he didn't make the point, and I know he would be careful about it and ha have an interesting thing to say about it. But there is no serious evidence that high social spending as a proportion of GDP deters economic growth over the long run. People have tried to make the case. Those analyses have never held up. Uh, economists like Peter Lindert and, and Joel Slemrod have uh, uh, energetically attended to that kind of analysis. You can play, th these are the kind of analyses you can play around with statistically. But if it were so obvious, it would be unambiguous. And the, uh, the economic statistical evidence tends to side with the fact that there is no relationship between high social spending and slow economic growth. And the fact that it's become a commonplace of conventional wisdom and people just say it as if, doesn't everybody know that, is quite remarkable. Mm -hmm. Professor Phelps, would you agree with that? Again, people do say it is commonplace to say, well, companies in uh, developed countries, particularly in Western Europe, have all these expenses for various uh, uh, employee benefits and such, and hence they simply can't compete. Um, yes or no? Uh, no, no. <laughs> I don't believe that. I, I mean, if that's, that ties in with what I was, as, something as I remarked on before, that uh, looking at the 20 or so OECD uh, countries, not just some tiny subset of them, uh, you, there is no relationship between the, the tax rate on labor and, and uh, hmm. Common uh, measures of economic performance, these proxy measures like unemployment rate and uh, even labor force participation rate. By the reason, by the way, that's not a heresy. Uh, actually, it makes good theoretical sense. If if a payroll tax rate in one country, otherwise the same as a, that is otherwise similar to another country, has always been high, so the the, the after-tax wage rates have always been low, then saving in dollars and cents will, will have been correspondingly low. And over the years, wealth, personal wealth, will be correspondingly rel relatively low, too. So, the, so the, the country with the low after-tax wage rates compared to its comparator will also have low private wealth. And what drives choices like whether to enter the labor force or whether to hang on to your job or not or whatever, uh, that's very much a function of the wage rate relative to, to your wealth. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. How come anybody worked in the 18th century with wage rates so low? That would be a silly question. We, we would understand there's something wrong there. <laughs> Let's turn to uh, some members of the audience. We'll take a question from this side. Thank you. Um, Mr. Dr. Madrick, um, you've been talking about the spending on human capital as being an indicator of, like, wh of why Europe might be doing better than the U.S. But I would assume that the correct measure would be the return on that investment rather than dollars, go, it's, it's output rather than input measures. So it might be that Europe spends more money, but if they're spending it on PhDs in obscure aspects of literature, it's not so helpful. If they're spending it on developing new drug, drugs, maybe it is. Yeah, I, <clears throat> I think that's true. I don't, I don't think, uh, you know, I do, it's a complex process. I just don't, I don't think just because the, uh, um, the government might subsidize education. It's going to interfere with where pe what kinds of uh, what kinds of professions people go into. Uh, there are lots of ways of doing it, but yeah, I, I, I think many economists agree that the important scarce resource will be human abilities. 
maybe even human optimism. But, uh, and that's what we, and, uh, and I think the U.S. is going to find over time that it's not doing an adequate job of that. How are you measuring that? How do you know whether like the U.S. Is education spending is more or less effective than Europe's education spending? Well, people have looked into this. I don't know the, you know, needless to say, you're raising an important subject. It's very hard to measure that kind of thing. There are some rudimentary ways to measure it, like the salaries you get if you have such and such a degree and so forth, and how much money you spent on the, on that degree. Uh, I, so it becomes more of, but it becomes more of a theoretical point over time. Uh, there are historical analyses of how education, transportation, infrastructure, uh, and even healthcare more recently have contributed. Consider this. Uh, that I think people don't consider it very often. Public investment in, in, in public health at the turn of the century, of the that is to say 1900, consider the economic ramifications of making a city like New York habitable by sterilizing, by the sewage system. This is an enormous undertaking t done by government. And how much did the city and the development of that city and the ability of populations to mingle with each other without catching the bubonic plague, how much did that contribute to economic growth? People haven't adequately measured that, but I think increasingly people look to cities as sources of growth uh, and economists are starting to catch up with that idea, but that's just one example. Okay, let's turn to this side. Uh, hi, uh, this question is for Jeff. Uh, you said that the growth rate in Western Europe will be greater than the U.S. in the future. I have seen polls where the people in Great Britain and France, more than half, if given the chance, would move here. But if Europe is going to be so much greater, then why is it Western Europe all want to move here while no one from the U.S. wants to move there? And second, isn't Europe really a very lazy continent where they get all their benefits from the government, where people in the U.S. don't mind working? Yeah, that, <clears throat> well, I'm shocked by the applause. Yeah, of course, all Europeans are lazy, and all Americans work very hard. I mean, that goes without saying. All Europeans want to leave Europe and come, I mean, <laughs> how can, you know, you know I, I hear this all the time. Where, I, uh, Europeans all want American products only. You hear this all the time, and I hear about it when, let's not say, when I get into my Toyota, put on my Lacoste shirt, buy my bottle of red Bordeaux, sit in the outdoor cafe and eat my French fries, I'm thinking, holy mackerel, get, uh, uh, salivate over buying an Armani jacket or a Prada, saying, holy cow, those crazy Europeans, what are they doing there? Why don't they all come here and buy our products? Let, let's Needless address. to say, I'd love to see that poll where half of European, half of French and Britain, I'd even put a dollar on it that you're completely wrong about that. Let's address the question where, in, a more moder in a more moderate forum. The there, there is, I think, a widespread sense that Americans, for better or worse, are more ambitious, more clawing, more eager to get ahead in the world. Uh, Europeans, in many cases, are less inclined to uh, aspire to more. As I say, that's, uh, that's the, moder the more moderate case. How address that one. Well, I don't, you know, I mean, Adam Smith was walking around Scotland <laughs> saying to himself, holy cow, look at these eager beavers making all this money in the UK. Um, the, if, if people aren't working so, you know, don't want to work so hard, I mean, first of all, is that so bad? But secondly, how come the GDPs, of, the GDP per capita of so many countries in Europe are almost equal to ours? And that's working fewer hours, and if they worked more hours, they would be equal to ours. So, uh, this, these, kinds of, uh, these kinds of reflexive attitudes based on, I, don't, I wouldn't even call it hearsay, it's based on wishful thinking. Go look at some numbers. Go look at some facts. And remember this when you're measuring standards of living here. I, and I, I know that Europeans are lazy, and that's why they like to get free childcare so their women can work, and uh, um, free university education so they can actually educate the population if they choose to educate the population and so forth. But think of this when you're measuring welfare and the status of people in terms of GDP per capita and money incomes. They have 
often have free childcare. They have free health care. And measured by outcome, average outcomes, their health care is invariably as good and often better than ours. Uh, they have, often have free universities. And then add that to their incomes, okay? And they have very good public transportation. They don't have some things we have. <clears throat> Needless to say, but I'm trying to open some minds here. It's remarkable to me. I'm Professor, sorry. Professor I'm sorry Phelps, to get a little are, you, are you overwhelmed with the flood of Europeans moving into your neighborhood? <laughs> <laughs> uh, lots of Turks <laughs> <laughs> at Columbia. <clears throat> <clears throat> Lots of uh, Germans and French, too, actually. Yeah. Um, um, let me um, get into this a little bit again. Um, first, um, Jeff Madrick says that uh, his statistics book uh, shows that uh, productivity per hour is right up there in, in, in France. Well, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of the the differences between the uh, Bailey Solo study of 1992 and the methodology of the OECD. But, <clears throat> but that same statistics book, I know, will show that uh, the productivity per hour in Luxembourg, say, is 109 uh, when the US is defined as 100. 9% higher productivity in Luxembourg. Maybe it's even 14% higher. What's going on here? Well, they're all investment bankers. There's a, uh, a selection problem here. The populations are not similar. <clears throat> um, it, with regard to France, there's another problem, and that is that uh, um, there's either two points here or one point, depending on how you want to look at it. Uh, the French drive up wage rates, <clears throat> which um, it means that they don't run into diminishing returns to, this, to the extent that American firms do. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> so um, hourly productivity is, is higher in France on that account compared with the US. Secondly, uh, the French government systematically makes it difficult for a lot of disadvantaged um, uh, young men uh, from uh, North Africa uh, to get legal employment in the business sector. So it's just no fair to be uh, competing in the numbers game with, with a country that uh, loads the dice that way. Um, um, I also thought it was sort of curious that uh, Jeff extolled American corporatism in the 50s and 60s. I didn't know you were such an admirer of corporatism. Uh, of course, that, you know, that was our glorious years. In fact, every country was pretty, every economy was pretty glorious during the 50s and 60s because a lot of investment had been deferred during the Depression and during World War II. And um, <clears throat> so, if for no other reason than that, uh, the United States was enjoying uh, pretty good productivity growth in the 1950s and 60s. I would think that the corporatism was retarding the economy, that it was a drag, and would have done an awful lot better than that <clears throat> without that rigid system of oligopolies and big trade unions that we used to be uh, laboring with at that time. <clears throat> Could I just um, <clears throat> come back to what I think is the main difference between us? <clears throat> I don't think that human capital is the driver of genuine economic development. <clears throat> I think that economic institutions that encourage and foster and permit um, innovation is the driver of uh, economic progress and job satisfaction, problem solving, discovery and development of talents, et cetera. Just piling on more human capital, more PhDs, and so forth, if you don't have the right infrastructure of economic institutions to create the enterprise that you would like to have, if you don't have that, the, the, all, all the human capital in the world won't add up to very much. <clears throat> 
Uh, we all know of anecdotes of taxi drivers in Delhi with their PhDs in philosophy who were unable to uh, get interesting work in the um, economic system built by uh, Nehru after uh, Lenin's uh, system in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> it's, it's so odd that, that the, much, much of the libertarian right and, and much of the left uh, both work, worship at the altar of human capital. And, and why is that? Well, I think it's just because for some reason that I, I can't get beyond, they, they both practice neoclassical economics. And, and they both just think in terms of, a, of production as a function of capital K and, and uh, labor L multiplied by human capital per labor, H, close parenthesis. And, and then to get more output, you just keep on stepping, uh, stepping up that H. And, and uh, that, that is neoclassical economics. That's a big chunk of neoclassical economics, but I don't think it explains anything in the world. I don't think it explains, uh, uh, it, it, it is no shortage of human capital <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> in, uh, <clears throat> so far as, um, in Europe, so far as uh, learning how to produce things, but there, there is a shortage of uh, university education when it comes to having an aggressive, uh, enterprising uh, economy competing around the world and developing new products and so forth. There's a well, big stumbling block there. I think human capital is one of the many critical aspects that shape the economic uh, uh, outcomes, both in the U.S. and Europe. I think it's, uh, it's not altogether clear just how important its role is, as you've indicated. And I think it's also not clear what the role of some of these other factors are. But I think going forward, it'll be very interesting to see how the U.S. fares vis-a-vis -vis Europe, both whose economic model and ultimately whose social model turns out to prevail and turns out to also be a beacon for the developing economies around the world. So I think our time has come to an end for this session, but we thank both of our speakers for their interesting comments. <laughs>